Francis Bacon, in his system called the Pyramid of Pan, to examine the sources of essential knowledge, had as the first source of learning tradition. Tradition covers the entire period of recorded knowledge from the beginning to whatever may become the e modern level. It will go on into the future, and much that we are doing now will add to the substance of tradition. Now, tradition is of importance to us in many ways, and I think Lord Bacon, being a devoutly religious man, was one of the first to recognize the tradition is more than the continuance of the record of mistakes. Tradition is a source of knowledge concerning the workings of universal law in the lives of individuals and collective groups. We have no direct way of tuning in on the infinite program in the ordinary knowledge of science. We are not able to be sure that we understand any part of that mystery which is beyond the comprehension of our sensory perceptions. We do know, however, that we have a kind of collective memory called tradition, which tells us a lot of things about the operations of the divine plan, even though we may not be able to classify them completely. If we want to know how man should live, we can only examine how man has lived what he has done right and what he has done wrong. We can only best base modern concepts of integrity upon the evidences of the past. And these evidences are usually rather clear, rather simple, and largely unacceptable. We do not like to re admit that anywhere in the universe there is anything that can prevent us from doing exactly as we please. Now, if we do exactly as we please long enough, we only have to refer to tradition to find out what happens to people who do exactly as they please. We not only have the problem of the past, but we have the daily newspaper. We have all kinds of records of what happens to people who do certain things. If we find consistently that those people who do those things come to those ends inevitably, we seem to get a touch of understanding of the operation of the moral universe. Now, apparently in the moral universe, the study of sin at its largest foundation. Sin was perhaps a word derived from the name of an old Chaldean moon god but it has long passed out of the theological structure of that kind. Sin to the modern religionist is an evil against spirit. It is some transaction affecting the internal life of the individual, and crime is that type of misdemeanor which affects the physical life of the individual. All material things can be termed basically in terms of crime and compensation, but metaphysical things become matters of sin, sin and honesty. Now, when we go back over the problems of sin and to see what might, why some of them are unforgivable and others seemingly are forgivable, we become more and more aware that the, uh, the basic integrities of life are uncorruptible, they cannot be broken down. They cannot be replaced. They cannot be ignored. But there is a vast structure of secondary factors ca that can in one way be adjusted, changed, modified, or reacted upon. So for all intent and purposes, what uh, Bacon called tradition presents us with a large pattern of a large group of great laws operating continuously throughout time and eternity. Now, what we have to understand first, perhaps, is that to a great degree we associate these laws with the divine purpose. In other words, the divine laws are the manifestation of divinity. Divinity itself is a word, 
standing for an immense, incredible moral causation for which there is no exception. We find that what we call divinity, therefore, is intangible, rather reticent in appearing, but constantly operating, and against the operations of this vast divine complex of things, there can be no escape, no evasion, and no cause of avoidance. The operations of natural law, particularly as these refer to the inner life of the individual, are inflexible. Now, if we want to study this a little bit, we can uh, take, for example, some thought that we all have or have had at one time or another. One could be fame and another could be wealth. Now, we can trace both of these terms back to prehistoric times and see what happens in connection with them. Well, we can start with someone like fame, and we can start in with a very early expression of this fame. Well, we'll take Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great had his idea of conquering the world. He be and began to be very unhappy at the thought there would be no worlds to conquer by the time he got through. So, with this great plan in mind, Alexander died in his thirties, at the, foot, at the foot of the city walls of Babylon, cut down by what? Dissipation. There was the end this great one who just knew everything but did not know enough to keep sober. Now we go along a little ways further in this great pattern of effects and so forth, and we come on Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, according to the speech of Anthony, was an honorable man, he was a warrior, a statesman, and uh, gradually came to be the moving power behind a great institutional uh, system and structure, the Roman Empire. And in the midst of all his glory, he was stabbed to death by his best friend and died at the foot of Pompey's column for the Ides of March. He was the great man, but all of a sudden he wasn't there anymore. All of the things he had planned, nothing happened. He was gone. Another interesting and rather powerful character song along this way was Genghis Khan, the great Mongol conqueror. He was determined to conquer everything. He was called himself the Son of God. He started forth, and where did he end? He ended on the outskirts of Europe, uh, tied with ropes to his horse so his people wouldn't know he was dead. That was the end of that great escapade. Now along comes another little man, physically little as well as every other way, and that is Napoleon Bonaparte. He was a real busy world conqueror, and he felt empowered by God to do this. It was a great project. He admitted, however, that it was easier to conquer than govern. He admitted that. Also, he admitted that he couldn't hold anybody he conquered unless they had a religion. But anyway, he went on his way, and in due time, ended his life at, on, on uh, the island of St. Helena. All the dream gone, dissipation gone, and very possibly poisoned by his own doctor. Then along comes another little man who thought he was going to be able to do great and wonderful things, Adolf Hitler. The story of him is rather well known, but because the traditional factor is no longer emphasized in education, an examination in the public school system showed that half the pupils did not know who Hitler was. That is the great memory of the great man, forgotten before he's hardly cold, and Hitler finally dead in a bunker in Berlin. And his friend, another fellow dictator, Adolf Hitler, not doing much, uh, Benito Mussolini, not doing much better, also died uh, assassinated or killed to get rid of him. So all these people together should have something to say about would-be empire builders. Something in nature says no. And everyone thinks they can be an exception to that no. 
but up to the present time there has been no exception. The way of peace is the way of survival. The way of war is the way of death. This has been proven since the very dawn of time. Some power beyond our own works out these things in patterns that seem suitable to our needs. Another one of our great fetishes is wealth. And wealth at the present time is very closely interwoven with conquest. A war and wealth kind of tie together now. In ancient times they were not quite so closely related. But wealth was a very interesting thing. On the, one of the great uh, rulers, the tyrants of Greece, uh, Croesus, had the, the so-called traditional wealth of the ages, the richest man who ever lived. He brought in a philosopher one day to look over his treasury. The philosopher looked back quietly and said, Croesus, you have a wonderful treasury in gold, but the first man with better iron will take it away from you. And that was what happened. All the way along, false values fail. And yet, strange as it may seem, false values seem to be the most attractive. No one considers a mediocre career to be as attractive as a few years of despotism. Uh, Mussolini himself said he'd rather be a lion for a few years uh, than a lamb for a lifetime. He got his wish. Now, Bacon, looking back over this situation, comes to the conclusion that there are rules and that when we start to do something, we are going to be faced by every bit of experience that has descended from the past. We are going to be faced with the problems of government. Government is another big one. And we begin to see what doesn't work and what does work. And if it doesn't work, we keep on trying. And generation after generation and civilization after civilization, we subject to exactly the same mistakes. We also have an idea that power is a reward for something. More likely, it is a penalty. Now, on the life level of average persons, uh, our old friend Bacon tells us, or shows us, the lives of private citizens on this mysterious pyramid of pan that ascends from earth to sky. The average citizen is, after all, the most fortunate of all creatures. He is not subject to the vast ambitions that end in annihilation. He is not subject to the great financial ambitions that lead him in the end to misery and death. And then, as a moderate person, he has great opportunities to do well in this life. But we begin to look over this individual and we find that time has been working quite a hardship on the concept. The individual today has no interest in being simply comfortable. His great desire is to excel and exceed. In science, mathematics, astronomy, and music were the sciences of antiquity. While we worked with them, they didn't do us any great amount of harm. In fact, they did considerable good. They helped us to develop our knowledge of the solar system. They helped to give us magnificent music and harmonies. And they helped to give us a deeper understanding of the world in which we live. They helped us to add up the grocery bill and things of that nature. But now all of a sudden, all of these subjects have loomed into vastness. They have become worlds in themselves. And these worlds are simply too small for people to live in without being constantly miserable. You can take the great world of science. It's a world so attractive, so remarkable, so wonderful, that most all young people want to get into it as soon as they can because they'd like to explore the idea of what is in space. They want to be on the first shuttle to Mars. It's all very good, but science has also handed us something we don't know what to do with even yet, the computer. Now, it's becoming more and more obvious that unless there is discipline in the productivity of science, if everyone invents everything he can think of, 
there's going to be a lot of trouble in this world because these things each has a consequence. And Bacon points out that when you make a plan to develop something, you always want to make a plan that includes a number of years of what's going to happen after you develop it. Because here we have a computer that at the present time is going forward at such a rate of speed that it is liable to take up practically every aspect of human life. First thing you know, they won't go to school anymore. Well, there's probably much, not much difference between modern education and computerized education, <laughs> but neither one is any good. <laughs> so we have this problem, a gorgeous situation coming along. We're going to do bigger and better things, no discipline, no control, and no idealism. Then we go into the practice of medicine. There have been great advancements of medicine since the cl clinics of Hippocrates. There have been wonderful values. Great physicians have arisen who have done much for mankind. Vesalius in anatomy and uh, Paracelsus in uh, pharmacology. All these things have been great contributions. But look at the condition of things today. The entire subject has gone mad and everything has been gradually summed up in the terms of profit. The end of science with the ancients was to serve the need of man. The end of service today is the accumulation of wealth. So we have a problem in which lack of morality has thrown the whole thing into a complete fiasco. Now the problems of religion are not essentially different either. Religion is becoming a combination of a divine revelation and a human nuisance. All that is essentially good we need, but it is being exploited right and left. And nobody has enough understanding in themselves to tell when they are being exploited. An individual choosing a religion should at least think about it enough to decide what is good for him. All this is a great, wonderful world, and here we, each of us, is another Alice, in this case, in Blunderland. <laughs> also, we go to another problem, entertainment. We all need to be entertained. The Greeks had a good theater, the Chinese had a good theater, the Japanese have. And most of the primitive people have had either their bods or skulls who were able to uh, dramatize uh, stories and do all kinds of things to entertainment, for entertainment. But all of a sudden, what is entertainment? Just a vast economic competition, practically nothing else, existing for the prime purpose of perpetuating advertising. So we go down one thing after another, anywhere we wish to look. We have find the same essential principles. Everything in all of these areas has suddenly become so completely economized and so pre completely exploited as every individual has deemed himself a proper billionaire, even if he doesn't deserve it. And the result is we have tremendous unemployment and poverty on the one hand, and reckless waste on the other. So Bacon, probably looking over these things, might say to someone that in the Bible, they did not actually give any definition for the sin that cannot be forgotten or forgiven. The unforgivable son, sin is marked only by the term that it is the sin against the Holy Spirit. Now, neither the Bible nor the church has been able to do very much with either of those terms. The Holy Spirit is pictured usually as a radiant dove. What it stands for is extremely uncertain, even in theology. And, of course, the unforgivable sin is referred to several times in the in the Gospels, but again, it is never defined as to what it really is. But looking over the present situation as it is, it looks very much as though un the unforgivable sin has something to do with things we do which cannot be forgiven. We can forgive each other small problems. We can forgive each other reasonable mistakes. Jesus said, the man who's taught or teaches against Jesus can still be forgiven. But there's something that can't be forgiven, and that is the complete correct, collect, uh, collapse of integrities. Now, we are in a world today where we have tremendous privileges, and uh, Bacon going through the story of the ancients, in a little book called The Wisdom of the Ancients, 
uses parables and uh, mythological accounts taken from the past to emphasize conditions as they exist at the present time. And I think we can very definitely indicate to our content that we are all suffering from sins for which we cannot atone except by penance. Uh, penance in this case is not the individual uh, doing a novena or something of this kind. Uh, penance is to recognize the mistake and try with every ounce of energy available to us to cure the condition. The problem of cure still is a long way off. And Bacon, in his summary of things, could present for us and in his term of scientific thinking, a tremendous uh, list of changes that have to be, or something somewhere is going to be really unhappy. Bacon was fully aware of the divine fact. He was fully aware of the fact that there is a benevolent force at the source of life, and that this inevitable benevolent force cannot be destroyed. This force is stronger than the whole structure of the solar system put together. In fact, it can control the entire uh, content of space. It is therefore inevitable, immutable, and irrefutable. And that is the law governing existence. Now, to understand the laws governing existence, we cannot be content with a scientific approach. We cannot merely use, take the law of gravity as a symbol of the great values of reality. It is interesting, it is valuable, and it is probably too true with certain modifications. But the great laws of life are laws of integrity. You have to use it well to be rewarded. And if you use it wrong, you will be punished. And for this, there will never be a solution. All the political change in histories that could possibly come will not make wrong right. It has never been able to actually right a wrong of the past. Everything has to work from a basis of solid principles. Principles which, if violated, will bring inevitable consequences. Uh, the absolution is available to the repentant person for certain values and mistakes of living. But after he reaches a certain degree of individual intelligence, he is no longer subject to the virtues of forgiveness. He must earn his way. Earn his way not through a mild economic crisis, but a tremendous journey through space. He must go gradually until he learns to use the great instrument constructively. He has to keep the rules and find that these rules are really keeping him, and that if he violates them, there is something wrong he cannot do anything about. Now, the seat of this concept in man appears to be in the soul. Therefore, the soul, in a sense, may be the dove of the Holy Spirit. The soul is a world structure of beauty, order, integration, and peace. It arises within the individual, it is communicated to the individual, and it is distributed by the individual. But the soul is an integrity in the individual. The soul is a peace at the source of individual and collective existence. The laws of the universe all spring from peace and must return to it after they have passed through these periods of perversion and perversity. So the soul becomes a symbol of integrities. It becomes the sign of doing it right. Now there's been quite a problem also in connection with religions. Religion has always been a more or less complex situation. We have been so busy downgrading other people's religions that we have really no thought or time for our own. In the world of religion, each believer is right, and all other believers are wrong, to some degree anyway. But in any event, religion is also mixed up in this problem of integrities. 
The religions of the world have all given us a Ten Commandments, or the equivalent thereof, and also special commandments like those given by Jesus to his apostles. The religions of the world are all based upon peace, upon the recognition of one divine power as Lord of all that exists. Most of the religions accept this, but do not practice it. In practicing it, they are exclusive when they should be inclusive. So religions are also in bad way. They are also breaking the rules of their kind. The rule of religion as given in every scripture of the world is love one another. And that if we have any real religion in our natures, we will forgive those who will work against us in one way or another. Now, a religious world of love at the present time does not exist. There are units of love within this religion. There are people who are trying, doing desperately, but the great pattern goes on in a form of an extreme comp competitive reaction towards value. And yet all these religions and their structures cannot work together. Therefore, in a day of a great emergency, when religious unity is essential to the support of something, the, the support is simply lacking. I remember attending an early congress of, on comparative religion. Now, that's a nice sounding word, comparative religion. But what was the congress composed of? A representative from each of the Christian sects, no non-Christian, was included in comparative religion. Now, this type of thing isn't extremely uh, obvious, but it's there. And the problems we have at the present time in the Near East are largely based on religion. All over the world, the struggle for integrities goes on. One group is trying to eliminate a religion entirely. Another is trying to restore it as the leader of human values. But up and down, in and out, and off and on, very few groups are practicing it in their own personal relationships. So here is another place where beautiful truths, beautiful ideals, are compromised for what? They are compromised because they interfere with the personal objectives of individuals. Bacon had quite a time trying to figure out what the man was made of on the inside. Uh, he could take care of the outside fairly well, but the inside was very mysterious. What is it within the individual by which he is desperately desiring of dominating some other individual? Why is it that he has to always be right when in life, time after time, he is wrong? I've taken people for consideration and study who say they have never made a mistake in their lives and because of that came to me because they couldn't stand it any longer. <laughs> They're making hundreds of mistakes. But for every one of them there was an excuse. It was always someone else to blame. The individual is very reluctant to admit any imperfection in himself. And if he does admit it, he passes over it lightly and thinks of something else. So we have another problem. What is there inside of the human being to help him to cure the problem we are in now? How are we going to face this dilemma? Here we have a world technically at war. Here we have poverty and wealth side by side as never before in history. Here we have genius and madness against each other. Vast political combines, great industrial combines, the economic system completely out of whack. Everything is out of relation and proportion. Why? Because each individual regards himself as a free and independent entity capable of doing and entitled to do anything he pleases, regardless of its effect upon anyone else. This is perhaps one of the uh, good definitions for and a sin that cannot be forgiven. We are not doing anything with the structure of our integrities. It is fortunate, however, that in the last 25 years, the divine plan, as Lord Bacon gradually unfolded it, is taking over. We are not at all happy about it, because when it comes to being good, we are extremely reluctant. 
We are much more interested in our own mistakes and keeping them up. We are not real, we have troubles with everything. We have troubles with everything from cigarettes to, do, to narcotics. Everywhere, every individual has the feeling that he is perfectly entitled to destroy himself. He is perfectly entitled to do exactly what he pleases and, up, and to anyone he pleases. He is an island of isolated superiority in a universe of mediocrity. The definition applying to each of them, of course. Now, all this together comes back again to tradition. There has to be some recognition of a universal fact that should be taught to every schoolchild and every adult and every oldster in a retirement home. Namely, you cannot break the rules without suffering. You cannot live against the divine plan without destroying yourself. This is an ine inevitable and an immutable fact, and we cannot find one episode in history where that has ever been different. We have also seen these negative factors destroy good factors. We've seen martyrs destroyed by fools and dictatorship. But in all in all, in the, in the long run, all things fall back into the mystery of the divine purpose. Why are we here? Why are we individuals? Albertus Magnus and uh, 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 the uh, others of that patristic school are quite convinced that man was given a certain amount of individuality. He was capable of making certain decisions and, and, and the privilege of fulfilling them. But when this individuality tempts him to transact various objectives contrary to integrity, the privilege ends. The individual is wrong the moment he does wrong. And he is wrong the moment that what he does helps or hurts in different ways. Every way we know that the plans that fail are the ones that were not right in the first place. Now we also realize that nearly all of the great philosophies, religions, and sciences of the world began in periods of comparative simplicity. Those involved had very small interests and lived in a very moderate environment. Great wealth was unknown to the average person in those days. They all lived uh, very much alike in a kind of moderate condition for their kind. Their education, their culture, their religion were all part of their natural way of life. Sophistication as we know it today was non-existent. So we find these people uh, finally developing within themselves one of the first human institutions of law, the Code of Hammurabi. This ancient code was to take care of certain of the minor delinquencies of the people of the area for which it was developed. That is the near what we now call the Near East. Actually, Hammurabi, well, oh, some 3,000 years ago, nearly, maybe a little more. But anyway, he uh, had uh, some ideas. But he evidently was being forced to ideas by the emergence of negative factors in human nature. One thing he says among his code laws is that if a builder builds a house that falls down almost immediately, he must build it again and do it right. Well, this was a great innovation. We haven't had that in Los Angeles in years. <laughs> we, don't, we don't even know such things as that. We've outgrown it. And we have outgrown it to the degree that every time there's bad weather, we have another period of devastation. On another ground, uh, Hammurabi also, Hammurabi went into other things. He disliked definitely the idea of alimony. He felt that that was a destruction of the home and the commercialization of relationships. Of course, we wouldn't believe that at the present time, but uh, we would do notice that sometimes the allotments are pretty heavy. Also, uh, Pythagoras, a little later, uh, brought in the harmony of music, and music as a symbol of harmony. He says, human beings, to survive, must live harmoniously. 
Harmony begins in heaven and ends in the gallbladder. <laughs> Harmony is not only a tremendous cosmic value, but it's the ability of the capillaries to get along together. The human body has to have harmony. It has to be taken care of. If we abuse it, it becomes sick. And when we are tired of seeing it sick, we decide that the gods are against us. All these things recognized in daily living are still not recognized on the moral level. The average person lives far below the moral level of the world status as it is today or should be today. We know much better than we do. And what we should be doing is trying to do what we know. But wherever what we know and should do interferes with what we want to do, we enter into a state of corruption. So all these things add up to one tremendous point, and that is that the mistake can never win. We will never be able to move the world into the kind of selfish situation, this aggrandized pattern which we want to indulge in. We can never live in a world in which everybody has too much. We can never live in a world where most people have nothing. All these things will not live and cannot survive because laws of nature are concerned primarily with natural processes. They are concerned with seeing the fulfillment of the reason for these various forms of life and the forms and phases through which they pass. Nature is honest, and uh, honesty is a tremendous virtue. A nature is honest because it has no choice. Whatever the power is of nature is irrefutable. Nature does what nature does, and by the power of the divine principle behind and within nature, nature moves in an orderly, progressive way to the fulfillment of, of, its, of its eternal purpose. Nature cannot be bribed, and it cannot be corrupted. But it falls into, pat into patterns in relationship to bribery and corruption. Little by little, it eats its way through all of the artificial factors that human beings have built up. So I think we can come back to the idea that perhaps, lacking a better definition, uh, one of the uh, sins that cannot be forgiven is the sin of personal aggrandizement and ambition, in which each individual wishes to be greater than the all. Each individual wants to be the chosen of eternity, and each individual is perfectly willing to sacrifice the rights of others to advance his own purposes. I think that this is a sin that cannot be forgiven, and it is not going to be forgotten. It is a sin which the cannot be atoned for and cannot give, be given some slight slap on the wrist. This peculiar pattern of individual life, which places what I want above what I am in every area, is something that we are all going to have to face. We can't keep it up. You look around us. We can see, and many people do see today, the problems coming closer and closer. It is evident that the individual must use the next few years, maybe 20, 25 years, to wake up or he's going to find himself in a very uncomfortable situation. The idea that the old prophet's head of going to hell is not very necessary. Plato says it's right here. In other words, Plato says you don't go there. You're born into it when you're born. In other words, the, this world is a world of, of instruction, of atonements, of understandings, of improvements, of dedications, and assurances of future, future integrities. It is a world in which we all are here to transact a kind of universal business by means of which we will learn to be constructive, useful, honorable members of a great plan that goes throughout time and space. It doesn't mean we're going to be enslaved to something. It does not mean that we're going to be deprived of everything we want. It's going to mean that we're going to use things properly, that we're going to find the great joy of peace, the great happiness of living in a happy world, rather than one which is in constant stress and terror of the day. 
So out of all the ambitions and uh, acquisitions of human thinking, behind all this terrific progeny of misfortune and bloodshed, we find this drive to world rulership. The drive, the drive towards becoming the greatest of the great, of being able to dominate others. The drive to enslave or in bondage other people, or to become masters over the rest of humanity. It may only be a little family problem with who is going to run the house, or it may be a national problem, how are we going to elect a president, or a world problem, how our nations are going to get together together in peace and meet it, mean it. But the fact is, as Bacon pointed out, watch, and you will see gradually the choice is restricted. There will be less choice. It won't be possible to make a dozen different mistakes. There will be only time and energy for one. And little by little, we will observe uh, that either these problems that we face today bring out something bigger in us, then we will have to continue to struggle with the sin that cannot be atoned the sin of wrong purpose, wrong objectives, wrong living, wrong thinking, and a grand time had by all. This type of thing is something that we're all involved in, in some way or another. Now, the average person is not a, a great sinner. A, a really great sinners are comparatively rare, but small ways of misfortune and difficulties come along almost every day. One of these problems is in the relationship of what we believe to be true to what we believe we can do. Let us assume for a moment that an individual believes in God, really believes, believes in a divine power at the source of life. Whether this is a person or a law or a principle or an energy, there's something there. That this something there has set up the moral codes of the world. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. All these are set up as rules for the whole world. Every nation has them. Every religion emphasizes them. People claim to be religious and are very important about these things. But can they honestly say that they have never borne false witness? Have they, are they able to say honestly that they have not avoided reasonable and proper responsibilities? Have they never tried to do a little more than they should? Have they had ever at any time tried to get something they didn't deserve? Or are they going along religion, religiously play, praying and playing the same old games that they've been playing for many generations? The problem is now getting very nearly critical. We, can't, we don't know what to do with much of anything. And the only reason we don't knew, know is because ambition and avarice are motivating practically every effort that we make. Therefore, there is a great sin. Perhaps the most uh, important of all the sins has been ambition. From this fell the angels. And uh, Job and uh, many of the mystics telling about the fall of Lucifer, Gaeta in his Faust, Milton in his Paradise Lost, all have emphasized that it was the human being who by his own selfishness and by false uh, experiences and falsified evidence has gradually deteriorated from the principles which are necessary to his survival. So, as with the angels, if they fell from temptation, the temptation of gain, the temptation of glory, the temptation of being more important than somebody else, all this has led gradually to a built-in webwork of ulterior motives. We cannot really be sure today whom we can trust. We do not know who is fair, who is honest, who is going to fulfill a contract. We are completely uh, rotted through with the one infinite desire for wealth and power. So we have to begin to think of this in terms of the great structure of life. 
Fortunately, as Buddha pointed out, we're going to have plenty of time to make the decisions. If we don't make them this time, we'll make them, because there's nothing else that can happen but ultimate surrender to truth. There can be nothing else. But it may take a while to get to it, because each individual will give up his personal privileges reluctantly, even though those privileges are killing him. He will want to die his own way. He would rather commit suicide than live honorably. All this is happening today. And it starts with a number of very interesting facts. It has been strangely lost in the uh, uh, struggle. God represents a parent, and a, parent, a parental principle. Humanity is one family. One family, a brotherhood and a sisterhood of all that lives. We are all intimately related if we can trust the Adam story. If we can't, we are still intimately related by the fact of proximities. We are here, and we're here to work with each other for the common good. Instead of that, we try to work the common good to, so that it serves each of us according to our own desires. Now, I think in the study of philosophy and so on that we've been working with for many years, that many people have made great advancement in this situation. They realize more and more of what is happening, and they're trying their best to do something about it. There is a great consolation in it for them also, namely that those who have grown, who have gradually conquered their own negative attitudes, who have made a real honest, earnest effort to be good citizens and good human beings, are not forgotten. Because, after all, the, the final judgment isn't here. The final judgment is the study of our own moral structure by powers that have the capacity to do it well. Actually, one of the first consequences that results from improvement is a change in the magnetic field of the human being. As we see some rather uh, peculiar-looking characters wandering around uh, who seemingly come out from some other place we don't know where, uh, we might also realize that the magnetic fields of such persons are as dis disjointed as their forms and bodies. The, the invisible furry dressing with which we are born takes on strange looks also when we become strange people. And all the way through the line, the values that we have start paying off the moment we have them. Now, we may not notice that a control of temper has any great effect on our outer lives, but you should see the magnetic field. You should see what happens whenever virtue or integrity or honor or self-sacrifice arise in the metaphysical structure of the human being. There is immediate evidence of a grace, of, an un of a new real realization of kindness and friendship. Magnetic field is the basis of all physical function. Therefore, from the improvement of this field, from a cloudy, swirling mass of disorder into a gentle, quiet, luminous raiment uh, of peace and enlightenment, the body begins to change the, its habits. First thing you know, the blood cells take on some of this. Little by little, every part of the body rises to meet the progress in integrity and improvement that we achieve within ourselves. Nothing is lost that is good. Nothing can be kept that is bad. Actually, therefore, we can see the integrities beginning to pay off inside. Well, inside is more important than most people realize. We've been spending too much attention on the outside. But it's on the inside that health, happiness, integrity, life, truth, realities, love, all these things are inside things. As they increase, the outside begins to reflect these increases. The individual looks better, feels better, is better, has a new inward chemistry, is no longer subject to numerous infirmities which are due to stress and emotional uh, tirades of one kind or another. Everything works better when integrities begin to develop within the person. And as they develop within the person, they also move out into the larger environment. The uh, great changes we hope for must come from human beings. 
who become aware of value. And when they become aware of value, they will also become aware of how to use it. And they will not start doing things that will make everything worse than it was before. For the time comes for us to realize that the, uh, well, let's say that the great unpardonable sin, when you get down to the whole root of it, is stupidity. <laughs> and that is comparatively incurable. You can't just toss it off. You have to wear it out. Stupidity must be transformed. Education must teach us to overcome the weaknesses in ourselves and not constantly burden us with the weaknesses of other people or other countries. Uh, stupidity is the individual feeling, is for some reason or other, that he's better than somebody else, but not proving it, because he has nothing to prove it with. Stupidity is the acceptance of false values. It is the idea of happiness built on intemperance. It is all kinds of mistakes. Now, some of these mistakes are comparatively slight. The individual will recover. But some of these mistakes can lead to long set and deeply in, and rooted mistakes that can cut through civilization and damage many generations. The health of the people today is perhaps as poor as it has been in a long time. A few people are apparently doing well, but the, the rich are the victims of the doctors and the poor are victims of something else. Everything is not what it should be. There should be some measure of integrity. Now, you can lose everything and you can still be a person of value uh, if your own integrity is there. Uh, then after the war with Japan, it was reported that uh, the emperor, who had tried in every way he could to prevent it, but could not, they say that in Japan, an individual who loses face loses everything. And they also said the emperor Hirohito lost everything, but he never lost face. And now this is what we have to think about maybe here. We must keep the integrities which are more valuable than anything we can own, possess, or hope for. We have to become aware that if we lose face, we lose all. And we lose face the moment we compromise principles. When we sell out integrity, our dignity is gone. Now, we are trying to think in terms of doing something about these things. And groups are springing up in many areas, working sincerely to find answers to some of these problems. I think the first thing that all of these individuals will have to do is to understand correctly their own motives. Now, many of them are, are doubtlessly very sincere and will gain and will give to important ways. But there are also a number of them who are interested from a sensational standpoint, who are interested in being part of something that seems to be going somewhere and at the same time have made no improvement in personal character. They still have the same old mistakes. And they're still the kind of persons who will drink a deep toast to temperance. All these things leave us without the strength we need. If people really believe that we are in trouble, and we are, then it is up to these people to make sure that in no way they are contributing to that trouble. If they can't do anything about it, they can at least not contribute to it. They cannot do the things which are not right. And if you want to know what those things are, Ten Commandments make a pretty good picture. We have to keep these rules. It's only when we are right that natural and universal integrity can support us. All through the time, where great teachers have come to the world to strengthen the integrities of human beings. Their doctrines have had great influence over long centuries and ages. But gradually, these doctrines have fallen into the keeping of persons who were not really dedicated. They have fallen into, into channels where they have become exploited and misused. So the whole problem of getting this thing back on its feet is to start with the individual himself. 
He has no right to blame others if he has not corrected something in himself. So we have certain simple things we can all do that will help a great deal. One is to recognize growth in occurrences as they come about. When we are caught short on something, the phone doesn't ring when it should, there's a tendency to be irritated. There has to be a power within ourselves that can control that irritation and prevent it from arising. The friends are not always kind. We have to face this and face it without contributing in any way to negative attitudes. Some problems are relational, some political, some social, but in all cases a problem is a challenge. A problem is an, a demand for a higher level of attitude on something that is occurring. And little by little, if we gradually use the universe as our basic text, we're going to get along much better than we do now. We have about 10,000 years of civilization that we can use in trying to decide what is right. We are going to learn how various attitudes had their inevitable consequences. Lycurgus, the, the tyrant of uh, one of the little Greek states, Sparta, was, uh, an, was not really a ruler at all. He was a kind of a substitute or a, an advisor or something. But he, he thought, took the state of Sparta, which was falling apart, and he made it become what is a word for the greatest self-control that the human being can have, the Spartan attitude. So Lycurgus said, here we have a country in trouble, not much money, nobody doing anything very well. So he made a series of laws. He said the first thing you're going to have to do is work. You're going to have to work whether you want to or not. And you're going to have to work whether you're rich or poor. And the fact you're rich cannot excuse you from cooperation in daily labor. The second thing he said when he, when he went in to get hold of it is that nobody should cultivate luxury. Luxury is indolence. Indolence inspires dishonesty. And indolence destroys initiatives and keeps the individual from being what he should be. So there's going to be no false luxuries, no privileges to classes, uh, no recognition of aristocracies, uh, no one too good to work, no one too lazy to work, and the, the community is going to become a well-organized structure with a job for everyone and everyone in the job. He made this stake and transformed Sparta into a great power, not because it had to be a military power, but simply because it had to be a power of disciplined people, all of whom cared enough for their country to take care of it. This uh, Spartan example would be quite useful here in our present environment because how many people really think enough of their country to take care of it? One thing is to use it, some to abuse it, some to enjoy it, but who to take care of it? We elect people to take care of it, and then we have to elect the, to take care of the people we elect. <laughs> but every individual on low or high point has a responsibility to use the knowledge that he possesses. When we have a new invention, there should be a dedication with it that will only be used wisely. When we develop a new science, that science should be adapted to the common good without a major expectation of exploitation. We should not be in business for profit, but in business for conviction and purpose and for cooperation for the common good. So, uh, uh, looking over the sins that they didn't di really diagnose in the scriptures, they say they're there, but they don't well know what they are. This one that is the one that cannot be uh, forgiven is the probably is the misuse of the assets bestowed upon us by the divine principle. We are given everything we need, everything necessary. To use it wisely is virtue. To abuse it is sin. And unless we are able to make this clear decision and do something about it in its own way, there doesn't seem to be very much chance for the good times we really will look for. We are, there is, however, a very optimistic note in all this. And that note is that it's becoming uncomfortable. The situation as it is isn't comfortable. 
And if there's another thing human beings love, it's comfort. We do not want to be worried all the time. We do not want to find it impossible to find work. We do not want to hear constantly the complaints of crime and sin. We want to be a people that are working, busy, up and doing, friendly, kindly, and cooperative. But we are doing everything in daily living to make this impossible. So we have to begin to think how to do some of these things better. Actually, the first line of defense in this matter really is young people. Our young people are the beginning of a system. Our young people are the ones that must begin to understand the facts of life. Even as low as the grade schools, there should be emphasis upon integrities. We should learn from childhood the privileges of living in a good country. And we should be willing to recognize our part of the need of defending, supporting, and expanding the concepts upon which our nation uh, has been founded. We need, definitely, to start young people off with gratitude rather than inordinate ambitions. We should not be teaching everybody how to become rich or how they think they could get richer. We should te begin to teach some of them how to be right in their living, their thinking, their home life, in all these things. Young people should be taught that life is an opportunity and a responsibility, but it is not a free ride. It is not something that you don't have to do anything for but enjoy. Also, as we go on with this, we find other factors coming in by which we can take young people and give them the integrities which they need to know. The textbooks for the American public school system need considerable revision. We need to get rid of a lot of things that we have considered to be uh, the very backbone of a competitive system. And well, the comp competition is gone. The markets are going fast. We are becoming one world, all in trouble together. And this the young people should know. They should realize that each individual, in one way or another, is either going to add something to the good or subtract something from it. The young people have, have a no real idea of what education is. What is education? Is it becoming smart? No, it's becoming good. Education is that which lifts an individual from the, in, from the uncertainties of infancy towards the, the certainties of maturity. And these certainties are all good. Education is not just reading from a book. Education is an experience of appreciating the values of the life which we live and the environment in which we live it. Education is, the, is really a, a value for sharing. Every educated person should teach too. Everything that we do should be done by example and by cooperation and by principle. There is no reason why we can't gradually begin a new generation of young people. Young people who are not as yet uh, completely enmeshed in the hopelessness of things. A lot of the rowdyism, a lot of the delinquencies we talk about are despair. They are young people with no future, no hope, no protection, and no values. This we call a country of civilized people. The world is in the same spot. A few countries are trying desperately to bring, to bring a better concept. But right here, we are the, one of the leading powers of the earth. And we should be setting the highest possible example to all other peoples. That our young people are growing up to be constructive, valuable citizens. That they're not here for a ride. They're here for a purpose. And that purpose must tie in some way with spiritual values. There's no use looking around us into the general fields of things to find defense or support for our principles. The support has to come from above. The support has to come from a standard of life superior to that of the human being. The only support we have is a universe that says we're doing it right. And when the universal principles were operating through us, 
say, well done, good and faithful servant, something has been accomplished. We cannot expect to be appreciated by only by others, but we shall be acceptable in the sight of the Lord if we get out and do the work. So we have this type of problem. Now, older people can certainly get into it also to any degree they want, but they must do it by trying to make some definite, constructive effort to do something for others rather than forever themselves. After all, there is nothing that has proven itself to be more transitory and more impermanent and a greater cause of contention and distress than wealth. Wealth has always been something that has divided human beings. It is also something that has in most cases ended in tragedy for the person who possesses more than they need. The uh, history of wealth is a very sad one. And uh, it's perfectly all right to assume that we should have what we need and what we think we should have. But the tremendous problem of this great structure of finance ending in the grave for every single person that we take nothing with us from this hoard we have put together we take nothing with us from the tremendous incomes that we have created and we very seldom leave much that does any good when we give this wealth to those who follow after us they become as unhappy as we are and the, the burden of wealth is to pass from one generation to another the most serious and terrible weight that the human soul must bear. There is no need for these things. The very simple problem again in the scriptures, store up your wealth in heaven. Well, heaven in this case meaning in inner virtues. Become wealthy in friendship and in peace and in understanding. Be wealthy in sympathy and learn arts and philosophies and various forms that make life richer and all that type of thing. There is, uh, there is no need to build a reputation on scandal or all these things which are now so popular. But uh, actually, I think we're seeing the evidence of a kind of desperation. It looks to me very much as though it's becoming more and more evident that we're going to have to do it right whether we like it or not. And this is almost more than we can bear. We just can hardly stand the thought that we can't make the good old familiar mistakes. Well, those mistakes are not as pleasant as we have often thought they were. No mistake is really pleasant. It's usually an evasion of responsibility. But there is a great need and a great light shining out. And I think that the, the scriptural writings uh, incline to the idea that the sin that cannot be forgiven is a kind of a combination term it is harder to forgive something when you know that you're wrong if uh, an individual doesn't know he's wrong you can forgive him but when he doing, does exactly what he knows he shouldn't do that in itself becomes more or less unforgivable we can't do that even though we forgive 70 and 7 times it's going to run out in the end we also have uh, a great problem here in trying to add something to the life values of the underprivileged. Something has to be done to make things a little more equitable, a little more reasonable. There should not be these sharp lines of demarcation with half the world hungry. All these things are problems that involve a, a planet and its entire population. And this planet with entire population is growing in population every year and at the same time carefully wiping out many forms of, of self-employment. Uh, we are employing less and less on account of profit. Well, this is not going to go on forever. It can't. Because if it ends up, we have to have what is one of the most terrible and tragic events of all and that is a finally a revolution of some kind we don't know, won't, don't know that we don't need it we don't want it but we're going to have to begin to pick some public servants who begin to see things in their proper light and in the religious work there's a new group of people coming up 
a group of people that are trying very hard to do things better than they've ever been done before and they are going to do it but with all their efforts to do the thing there is a great need for a dedication to the divine purpose of life we should be doing these things not because we want to be happier but because we want to be better we should do these things not because we get recognition for doing them but because they are valuable and necessary things even if they are only criticized we should not allow the social side of religious or philosophical organization to conceal the need for the good hard work that must be accomplished to get us out of the present doldrum everyone therefore who is dedicated uh, to a principle a desire to do something better should also make an offering in the ancient times they used to bring offerings to the altars of their gods and we don't do that very much except through the collection plate but at the same time the old concept lingers on we all make an offering to our gods so if we are going to be religious people in orthodox or unorthodox lines uh, along mystical or philosophical transcendentalist lines let's bring an offering when we join an organization or side with it let's bring to the altar of that organization a corrected error something we are going to do right from now on in our own lives let us bring a reform within ourselves which has become important let us say this from this moment on my gift to God is that I will not be jealous of anyone this is a, a way to you know get some vitality behind it and that the individual gives something that he shouldn't be doing gives it away entirely and ceases doing it in the name of the thing he wants to do which is better nobler and more realistic so if you have a nasty situation of some kind and you go into religion bring that situation to the head finish it and do everything possible to finish it constructively if you can't do it that way at least carry no note of, of anxiety or d of dislike or anything in your heart do everything you can possibly do if you have been uh, uh, if you've spoiled a child take the obligation to assert discipline as part of what is necessary if you have vanities of your own that other people don't know about choose something that is significant and say I bring this to the altar of truth I'm giving away something I don't want anyway but don't know that I don't want it I'm giving away something that has made me sick and miserable for years but I've nursed it as I would nurse a weak baby do these things bring to the organizations which you form a definite act of personal dedication a dedication that is far greater than any other gift you can give trying to use truth to grow which is its proper purpose using tr uh, new ideas to strengthen principles and to carefully avoid all types of uh, bargaining and uh, compromising uh, that may have affected you in the past I know people have a terrible time when they get a phone call and they're busy they don't want the phone call while they're out watering the lawn or something of that day. so they get nervous and they come in and they kind of complain and they're short come in quietly there are no interruptions in a well-ordered life you flow from one thing to another and if the things you are doing are for the good of the world you will always have the chance to do it and as you go on through life and come finally to the time of the mystery might say when you have to be, be told or taught or realized whether or not you're going to uh, be forgiven if you're at the edge of this life and have to go over into the next one every kind deed is there to vouch for you everything that you have done to improve your own inner life it makes a shining star for you <clears throat> and in the great universe of things these deeper invisible values are the most important and if you are really trying nature will protect you forever nature doesn't ask you to start in immediately and be successful the divine plan is eternal you're in it for all eternity 
you must go through it forever on and on and on because but not because it is always going to be a nuisance to you because the moment you understand it you have a magnificent transmutation the alchemy of transforming the daily burden to the daily privilege the transformation of the individual who using his will to accomplish his own purposes dedicating that will to the accomplishment of the divine purpose all the way along the alchemy of transformation means that for every physical thing you do better there is a change in your psychic chemistry there is some growth or influence showing and when the time comes when the when you have to face up to it all you will find that your star will shine so brightly you don't have to defend yourself it's the it's not even that you're successful just a good try is a little spark when you need it and in our daily lives today we are all of impermanent but we are part of something that is going to go on and we're going to go on with it we're going to go on through time and space and in all these different times and spaces we're going to have beautiful experiences wonderful adventures incredible opportunities to find come closer and closer to that infinite benevolence which is the principle of universal love for all that lives these things are within our reach but we have to kind of get hold of some of the shortcomings and in the last few years this older world we're in now has had a lot of shortcomings and we've had two desperate desperate wars in this century we have not learned a thing from them we haven't realized what the values are and the only way we're going to get that realization is when each person realizes it in his own heart and simply for, refuses to be part of destruction so we have a, a great inducement now we have an inducement financially we have an inducement personally emotionally educationally politically industrially financially and morally we have uh, we are on the stand on the edge of something we must make decisions and that the right decisions will carry us victoriously into the next century there is an ancient prophecy relating to this part not as nostradamus was one of those who prophesied he said after the end of the 20th century there would come the paraclete the paraclete is the prince of peace and from that from the end of that time from the end of the present century for a long period to come the world will be at peace and people will grow and love and serve and work together but this is the time of more or less the dead the, the uh, death hour the dark hour the hour of unknowing through which we must pass from the night of our own pressures to the daylight of a golden age for the golden age is really the age in which the soul shines over all the rest of life so we have to kind of work it out the best we can but i think if we have to sum it up that the unforgivable sin is uncontrollable personal ambition willing to sacrifice all to personal aggrandizement while this continues there can never be real peace but in the old philosophies those who do this those who give everything else simply for material wealth are probably going to have a very different kind of embodiment next time in which the sins of this time will become more evident to them there is no need however for anyone to go out of this life better than they came into it one little resolution one little effort one little good deed has its little shining star and we are sure shot of short of stars so we better get to work them and build them just as fast as we can oh thank you very much